had a career as a high-level corporate merger attorney, a very successful, lucrative career, and had a story that he's going to tell you about uh, a setback and a health issue that, that he has been uh, healed from, has a great heart uh, and a great story to tell. And so without further ado, give a warm Chippewa Valley welcome to Jay Dunn. Thank you, Keith. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I've got a lake home just up the road in Cumberland. Uh, won't make it there this afternoon, but I'll be there early tomorrow for five or six days. So I feel welcome, even though I've crossed the St. Croix. Uh, we do have our Badger and Green Bay uh, sweatshirts at the lake. When we go into town, it's wise to wear those, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm honored to be here to talk about the subject of generosity to generous men. Uh, if there was ever a, a generous man who led with power in my life experience, it's uh, Jesus, the Lion of Judah, who I presume is the symbol of the get-together. So uh, I honor him and bless him and pray that uh, he'll join us this noon as we chat about uh, the important subject of generosity and the question of how much is enough. Um, I did bring extra copies of my book. I don't presume you'll be interested in them, but in case you have trouble in the back seeing some of the cartoons I'm using, you might want to pick up a copy of the book because my presentation will pretty much mirror the book today. I like cartoons because it lightens up a heavier subject, and I like the New Yorker cartoons, and I like Far Side cartoons, so we'll be talking about those a little bit today. Um, one of the things of, among many that I love about Jesus is that oftentimes when you'd ask him a question, he would respond with a question. And so by my own faith journey, as I've asked him this question of how much is enough, I think he might just answer, well, how much is enough of what? Now, we sitting here in the room, I certainly think of the question, how much is enough, is how much have I accumulated financially? You know, what's my investment portfolio look like? How many German sedans am I driving? How many homes do I have? What the world tells us is the question is, how much, of, uh, how much is enough is how much of... Uh, the earthly riches in life have you accumulated? I think Jesus looks at the question very differently and uh, might say, well, uh, what about the true riches? If you're not trustworthy with earthly riches, why would I entrust you with the true riches? So this whole question of the true riches is an opportunity to look at both sides of the equation. The true riches to me are about a more intimate journey with him about a more serendipitous understanding of what happens in life, about intimacy, about having an audience of one, about understanding a relationship with the Lord ever more closely so that he's a bigger partner in life. And as I get into talking about that today, I want to use an image that we use at a ministry I serve in Dallas called Halftime. I serve two ministries. One's the National Christian Foundation, headquartered in Atlanta, with 30 offices around the country. I'm privileged to serve in Atlanta and in Minneapolis at the NCF Twin Cities, where the world's largest faith-based provider of donor-advised funds, which is a particular charitable giving mechanism. So we uh, brought in about a billion, seven hundred million of contributions last year and forked out about a billion, four hundred million to 24,000 different nonprofit organizations. It's a large ministry that encourages generous giving. That's the National Christian Foundation. The other ministry I serve is called Halftime, founded by a guy named Bob Buford, who passed away in April. But Bob had a ministry to women and men in the marketplace, moving from success to significance, looking for their Ephesians 2.10 calling. Each of you is God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that were ordained for you beforehand that you might walk in them. Each of you has and Ephesians 2.10 calling, and halftime is about helping you find that calling and then living that out in ways that make you a lot happier, bring joy and, and meaning to your life, um, and, and serve causes that Jesus cares about. At the Halftime Institute, we use this image called the sigmoid curve, and we talk about how in life we go up the left-hand slope, we uh, move from uh, struggling to success, we come to the question of significance, what's this mean in our life? When you go through a season of change, represented by this oval at the top of the sigmoid curve, and that's a season during which 
We're asking questions like, is that all there is? What more might there be? What might I do next? I'm a little bit weary of what I'm doing now. So we help half-timers go through that with the thought that they'll emerge out of that experience and ascend up into something that has more purpose, more meaning, takes advantage of who they've been, as opposed to just sunsetting and selling the business and going to Naples to play golf. The halftime experience takes us through this sigmoid curve. And really, when we look at that, and you all can think about this in your own life, I submit to you that each of us goes through a whole series of sigmoid curves. It begins when we're born into the world. And so I talk about being shaped, struggle, success, significance, and surrender. We're born into a household. My uh, father was the oldest of eight, born to a uh, rural mailman and a night janitor. My mother was the fifth of eight, born to poor Swedish immigrants, grew up sleeping in a, in a full-size bed between her sisters, Edith and uh, Helen. Um, one side of the family had a poverty mentality has that to this day. I have an older brother who lives in affluent Montecito, California. He makes a lot of money and he's afraid of being poor. But we come into the world and we look at the issue of generosity and we grow up and we're shaped in our upbringing. Each of you was shaped in your upbringing and you enter into the world, you make it through high school, you may go to college, you may go to tech school, wherever you may go, but you enter the real world and if you're like me, you struggle. You work your tail off, you may be married, you go through a season and a sigmoid curve of looking at, you know, what's this mean? What does success look like? I'm pursuing the American dream. I want to be successful, oftentimes, as the world defines that. So there is a season during which we chase that as well. But then we run out of meaning in that oftentimes, and we ask the question, well, what's it mean to be significant? What's, what more is there that I might be engaged in? But ultimately, I submit the issue comes not to an issue of significance, but a question of surrender. And that's where, in the context of how much is enough as the world defines it, how much money have I accumulated, it takes a real transition in the way we think and the way we act in order to move through that sigmoid curve. So that's a big question of the day, how much is enough? So here's an image of a guy who makes it to the pearly gates. St. Peter's there, he's got the book of life. He looks at this guy who shows up and he says, tell me you did not pull up in a limo. Okay? We don't want to pull up to the pearly gates in a limo. We want to think about the ability to create wealth as something that comes from the Lord. We want to make good use of that on an ongoing, current basis. But along the way, along the way from the journey from earthly riches to the true riches of a greater, more intimate relationship with the Lord, there are obstacles that we face. One of them is called mammon. Jesus used the word mammon, uses the word mammon for the first time in the Bible in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 24, where he tells us that we can't serve God and mammon. Now, many Bible translations use the word money. You can't serve God and money. I much prefer the word mammon because I would submit for your consideration, and the door's right there, you can throw me out anytime you want, I've encountered mammon not so much as money by itself, but as a spiritual force that influences how I think about money. It's like an invisible laminate that exists over what I've accumulated. And I'm gonna to to take a little risk here, and I'm gonna ask Keith to step up here for a moment. Just take a few laps around me if you would, Keith. My purpose in the demonstration is to, uh, uh, if you have any fruits or vegetables, now might be the time you want to start throwing them at me, but uh, uh, mammon, that might be enough, all right? <laughs> I was kind of getting I, I, into I, it. I, I've, got to get out, I've got to get out of this somehow. That, you're doing fine. For your consideration, I encourage you to Google the word mammon. You'll see all kinds of hideous looking ghoulish figures and things like that. This is one of the easier looking figures of mammon. Someone whose identity and its security is what he or she has accumulated. But mammon has an effect on us in culture. You look at what you may have accumulated and you say, well, 2008 was a tough year. You know, I'm hearing lots of things about an, uh, uh, a bear market that might be coming my way. I've got a kid that I just sent off to college. Gee, I really need a new car. I don't know if I can afford it. I'm a generous person. Here's my two, two and a half percent of net income that goes to the church. Mammon is a long list of cultural realities that wrap us up in ways that prevent us 
from being more generous people. I submit once again, you just think about this as we go forward. Is mammon a factor in culture? Is it a factor in your own life? So Keith, I may yeah, need your help again. Yeah, okay. I believe there is a way to escape mammon, but it's not all that easy. And it's not as easy as what Keith just helped me with right there. Mammon exists in culture. There I am wrapped up as I just was. I don't know if you know about the FedEx logo, but if, if you look at the FedEx logo, there's an arrow in it. How many of you are aware of the arrow in the FedEx logo? Okay, the arrow is a horizontal arrow between the E and the X. I never saw it until I saw it. Now that's all I see when I look at a, uh, when I see a FedEx truck, I just immediately see that arrow. Mammon operates that way. It's in plain sight, but it's invisible. It has a huge effect in culture. It may have some effect in your own life, but it's something from which we can escape. So Jesus talked about this. He didn't talk about the sigmoid curve, but here we are at the question of are we going to think differently about what we've accumulated, about how much is enough. And so in my own life, I come up the road of success to significance. Mammon is occupying my thinking along the way, as I'll get to shortly. I come up to the edge of this sigmoid curve, uh, curve and I've got my uh, semi-trailer truck loaded with all my goodies, my investment portfolio, everything I've got. I'm riding shotgun. Mammon's at the wheel. Jesus comes walking up to me at the front edge of the oval. He says, Jay, uh, how are you? We've known each other for quite some time. Here we are at the eye of the needle. You know, it's going to be tougher for you to get through this eye of the needle than it is for a camel to make it through. But all things are possible. I'd like to walk with you on a journey that helps you rethink what is it that you've accumulated? What are the purposes of why you've accumulated? So why don't you just back up a little ways, get rid of that driver, unload that trailer, and come on back. I'll meet you right here and we'll walk through the eye of the needle together into a life that I've designed you to live. So that's where we begin this journey across the sigmoid curve. While this is highly individual to each of us, and it was certainly unique and individualistic in my own life, there's nothing new about this. If we go back to the book of Genesis, in the first chapter of Genesis, we see that the Lord created the earth and everything that's in it. And if you think of planet earth, it's the most incredible investment portfolio you could ever think of. I mean, think what's in the earth in terms of oil reserves, natural gas reserves, fisheries, lumber, precious minerals, Think of planet Earth and what the Lord put in there. And he says in the beginning to man, to Adam, and to us today, get in there, subdue the Earth in its vast resources in service to me and your fellow man. The purpose of wealth creation is to serve our fellow man and to serve the Lord, to be generous men, thinking of others, perhaps blessed with the ability to create wealth. That opportunity doesn't last very long. On page 5 of my 1300 page Bible, the quote unquote fall takes place. The Lord's not too happy about that. He looks at Eve and he says, you're going to have some problems uh, and pain in childbirth. And he looks at Adam. And he says, you know, you're going to work your tail off. You're going to work in the dust. There are going to be thorns and thistles along the way. You're going to have to grind it out every day in order, in order to squeak out a living. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you have had a thorn or a thistle in your business life on the way growing up? How many of you have, count, have encountered a few problems along the way? So we skipped the original opportunity, but the opportunity remains available to us. But this issue has been consistently applicable to mankind, mankind from the beginning. We move, we move forward to Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. The nation of Israel is about to cross the River Jordan. Moses isn't going to make the trip. But he looks at the nation of Israel and he says, now when you cross the Jordan, you're going to get over there and you're going to build yourselves all kinds of big homes. You're going to have all kinds of cattle and wonderful things and you're going to think you did it yourself. How many of us think that we built our own wealth, that we created it, that we deserve it? And he says, but I want you to remember that the ability to create wealth is from the Lord meant for his covenant purposes, Deuteronomy 818. I encourage you to look at the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy and get to verse 18. It talks about the purpose of wealth creation. We move forward to Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, but for Jesus. He writes in the book of Proverbs all kinds of admonitions and warnings against wealth and other pleasures of life. How does he fall? Through wealth and the pleasures of life. 
He wrote the book, but he succumbed to it behaviorally. We get to the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, and in chapter 3, the nation Israel is not giving. They're not a generous nation. And he looks at them and he says, hold it, you're withholding the tithe. I've created opportunity for you to have a life that's truly abundant. Why don't you give me a chance? Why don't you open up the windows and, uh, and honor the tithe, honor the mandate to give, and I'll show you how great this relationship can really be. And then things go dark at the end of the Old Testament. For 400 years, along comes Jesus, and he makes this statement once again about you cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus knows that mammon, that money, that wealth accumulation is a tremendous obstacle to, in, to intimacy with him. There are twice as many references to money in the Bible as any other reference, roughly 2,350 verses. It's a big, big subject matter. If we advance this 2,000 years, to the end of World War II, the greatest generation came home from the war and started making babies and businesses. Tremendous time of economic growth. In 1958, Congress passed the S-Corporation election. Some of you have S-Corporations. That allowed owners of businesses to pump their profits into the business instead of being taxed at a corporate level. The profitability could be taxed down to them individually. In 1977, Wyoming passed the Limited Liability Company Act, which allows similar investment by business owners with LLCs. Some of you have or are involved, are involved in LLCs. Well, as of today, we've got the greatest wealth accumulation in the history of the world over the next 20, 25, 30 years. More than 30, 40 trillion dollars will transfer generationally, not just from the greatest generation, but from the boomer generation. What's going to happen to that wealth? Well, the body of Christ is just way behind in terms of wealth transfer and where that should go. Less than one in 10 Christians has an updated estate plan that leaves something to the Lord. Very few of us by percentage have really thought about how much is enough, what's a reasonable amount to leave my children so as not to be an infidel, but to empower them in some way, but otherwise use what I've accumulated to help other people. How many of us have updated, notarized, effective plans that specify how that'll happen? Tremendous opportunity over the next period of years to really think about how much is enough, how much is enough for my kids, how much is enough for my fellow man. And rarely in my experience will you ever get to the answers to that question unless you first talk about it with your spouse and you have a sense of what will actually really empower your children as opposed to cripple them by giving them way too much beyond what they could uh, really prosper from. So let me take this personally back to my own story. Um, uh, I uh, was with a very large law firm till I was 30 years old, had worked my tail off, wanted to uh, uh, stay married and uh, coach Little League football and baseball. So I coached 16 Little League football and baseball teams as I started my own law firm. Was very fortunate to strike up a relationship with a wonderful business owner and then had a major life-changing spiritual event in my life in 1981 when I was 32 years old where my wife Sally and I met the Lord in ways that we hadn't met him before. It was a very powerful experience. And from the time, uh, from 1983 until 2000, uh, I, uh, I created a private foundation, excuse me, to support Christian ministry. And I had a schizophrenic life uh, in law and business. Resources were flowing generally, at least for good deals. Plenty of mistakes along the way, but resources were flowing. But in terms of nonprofit work, support for the Lord's work, resources weren't flowing. I had a schizophrenic, almost daily experience looking at tremendous need for resources and then tremendous resources that oftentimes were frittered away. And in my own giving journey, I was going back and forth too. I knew what it meant to be generous, but at the same time I was conflicted about it. If I gave too much, I, uh, uh, the devil would kind of tap me and say, uh, you know, I don't know, you gave too much. That, are you sure you can afford to do that? If I gave too little, he would uh, come at me and say, you know, you're, you're kind of cheap. You could have given more than that. So there was kind of a no win over an extended period of years. So out of the far side, come on, come on, it's one or the other. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. It was a, it was a schizophrenic life in terms of living generously. But I moved forward. And uh, in 1999, when I was uh, 50 years old, I was intimately involved in helping my best corporate client merge with its uh, biggest worldwide competitor and then take, took the company public 
in the year 2000. Um, and I can guarantee you that every hour of every day during that process, I knew exactly how many shares of that company I owned. I listened very intently to the investment bankers talking about what the IPO price would be. I thought about how long I'd be locked up, largely six months on the back end of a deal. If you're an insider, you can't trade your stock. So I could tell you at any moment of any day um, what my net worth was going to be after the deal was done. And was very influenced by this New Yorker. Cartoon money is life's report card. I absolutely had that as part of my identity along the way, no doubt about it. And along the way, I worked my tail off. This says, I'm not a machine, Deborah. I can't just turn my greed on and off. Okay? <laughs> I, I was enshrouded in mammon. There's no doubt about it. I was wrapped up in saran wrap. The moon was out. I was still working at night. I got pneumonia twice along the way. The investment bankers and my client said, you got to go home. I said, I'm not going home. I, we're, we're not going to go home until this deal is done. And uh, I was intimately involved with it. So along the way, I paid a price in the context of my health. During the six month lockup after closing of the deal, I was hit with a neurological disorder that took my voice for six years. Um, there weren't all that many people in the Twin Cities who were upset about one lawyer in town that couldn't talk, I can tell you that. <laughs> but, but it was an intimate journey for me. I traveled the nation looking for advice. The only treatment for this disease was uh, Botox injections, originally with a long needle around the larynx into the muscles that spasm to pop the vocal cords open. I found a guy in Chicago, I called him the Robin of Loxley of Botox. He injected right through the larynx and the Botox would hit those muscles and it would dampen their ability to spasm. The risk was asphyxiation if you put too much in there because it would collapse the vocal cords. But I went for a period of years flying to Chicago every few months to get these injections and then uh, had a powerful experience in July of 04 where out of Isaiah 53, 5, uh, watching the movie The Passion that Mel Gibson produced, I witnessed Jesus being uh, tortured before he was crucified. And in that Isaiah 53, 5, the reference is that I was chastised. He was chastised for our peace. And I had a physical, spiritual, emotional experience then where I said, hey, if I never get my voice back, I'm going to be OK with that. Because if he went through that for me, I'm going to be peaceful. And I was not peaceful because I've been able to muscle my way out of most situations in life. But in July of 04, I began, thank you Lord, for, on a recovery path where by November of 2006, when I flew to Chicago to be treated, my uh, doc said, hey, Mr. Bennett, on rare occasions, the brain quiets down. I don't know if I'm going to see you again, and he hasn't. I had no Botox treatment since November of 06, so I'm thankful to the Lord for that. But in those years, having uh, looked at the issue of health versus building resources, I understood this one. Feeling poorly? Thank heaven I thought you said you were feeling poor. So, so many of us give so much of ourselves, not only in our health, but relationally, in order to accumulate things. Where's our perspective on that? And my perspective was way off back, back, back in the day. And so I had six years of reflection. And I thought about what I had given up and how hard I'd worked to accumulate what I'd accumulated. And here are a couple guys on an airplane. How little we really own, Tom when you consider all there is to own. There's an endless game that's in play. Mammon would put us on a never-ending quest for more and more and more. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. So it, it's something that has to be understood and dealt with. And along the way, uh, feelings of insecurity. This cartoon says, poor Henry, he just discovered Bjorn Borg makes more money than he does. Now, I could have used Roger Federer, I could have used uh, Aaron Rodgers, he just signed a pretty good deal. Uh, Kirk Cousins just signed a pretty good deal, although he only gets 84 million guaranteed. But I don't know if Kirk uh, is envious of Aaron, I suspect he isn't. But uh, envy and thinking about what the other guy has and what I don't have, there's always a faster gun. And Mammon will lay that on your emotions as well. And the sense of envy. I, w I was, uh, over the years, an architect of a fair amount of wealth for a number of clients, uh, and they would always gripe about their legal bills, but uh, they ended up with multiples of uh, what I got, and so there's this feeling of, gee, look at what I helped create, 
and you go visit your buddy and he says, would you like to see my pile? Okay, there's always this sense of the other guy has more than I have. I don't know if you ever experienced that or not, but it's part of the journey. But what I really realized as I was contemplating change in this quiet period of my life was that I really had a limited perspective. I needed to broaden my perspective. Here's a guy who says, I've learned a lot in my 63 years, but unfortunately, almost all of it is about aluminum, all right? <laughs> we, all, we all have our specialties. But I also realized that as I looked at earthly riches versus the true riches, and I've run a private foundation for 20 years at this point in time, I still realized that earthly riches had a huge hold on me, oftentimes in invisible but very real ways. And how was I going to deal with that? I was like this Viking ship where you've got these giant guys that are muscle bound on one side and he's got these little wimpy guys on the other. I've got the same sense, Omer, a strange feeling like we've just been going in circles. You know, <laughs> you got the muscle guys pumping and that boat's going in circles. So how do we, it's like a set of barbells. You have a bar and you have sets of plates on one side and in the earthly riches side we stack up all kinds of plates on one side of the bar and there aren't many plates on the other side of the bar. So when you lift that bar, it's only going one way. How do we shift the plates of our understanding and our life experience to balance the bar so that the true riches, relationship with the Lord, is such a reality in our life that it's worth more than what we think has had worth as we grow up? A glimpse of the possibilities. You know, I, again, have been running a private foundation for a long time. And I had some sense of the blessing, of the joy of generous giving. I understood that a little bit, but I didn't understand the full spectrum that was available to me. That's him, that's the one. I'd recognize that silly little hat anywhere. It wasn't just the little silly hat of my limited understanding of generosity, it was the whole opportunity for a more generous life that was right there in front of me that I wasn't fully understanding despite my life experience. And as I contemplated these things and continued to seek change, I really developed an inner desire that that kind of change would happen. So here is the before and after. See, Frank, keep the light in their eyes and you can bag them without any trouble at all. So here's a guy with a little green hat on. He's shining his flashlight down on a frog. He's telling his buddy that if you shine the light on the frog, you're going to be able to catch that frog. Meanwhile, the light of the world is shining down on the other guy and the Lord wants to bag him in ways that uh, isn't quite understood. So there is opportunity. The light of the world is, wait, is, is waiting to awaken us and show us uh, into the realm of the true riches. And so once again, there I was at the eye of the needle. Um, and I looked beyond my historic orientation, my own historic uh, sense of value. And I began to get more curious about, well, what are these true riches all about? What are these things like intimacy with the Lord? And, Security not in my financial wherewithal, but in my relationship with him. Um, how, do I want an audience of one? Do I want to better understand the spiritual nature of the Lord that he makes available to us? So as I thought about that, what might I do to better understand the true riches and make those a palpable reality in my life? Why well, I'm motivated to go deeper into those things so that they really change the way I'm thinking and acting. I looked at the fruit of the Spirit, which is in Galatians. And I looked at the Spirit of the Lord, which is in Isaiah. There are 15 factors there. The Spirit of the Lord is a spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and reverential and obedient fear. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You can, I won't repeat all of them, but I began to look at those in greater measure. And I began to study those and look in the Word at those. What does patience really mean? Am I really experiencing peace? I sought a deeper level of those attributes of the spiritual realm that the Lord offers us in order to mature us into a more intimate relationship with Him. And then, I, beyond having a vision for what could be, I said, you know, this is really kind of a faith decision. I had had a miraculous recovery of my voice. That's because people prayed for me and I got world-class medicine, but uh, they helped me find the faith to believe that I would be healed. I describe faith as a transport vehicle into transcendent reality. By claiming the truth of God's word beyond my sensory truth, I was able to see myself across a, a chasm of affliction and to see a place where I might be restored, whether that was in glory or on planet Earth. And as a result of that, the idea of by faith 
thinking about how might I renew my mind, how might I think about money and accumulation of wealth differently, became attractive to me. I knew that if I had the faith to believe that, I might get there. And then the other way that I thought about was, well, how do I increase my generous giving? I became a student of, the, of neuroscience and, and the chemistry of generosity. There's vast amount of, and growing amounts of knowledge that talk about generosity generates brain chemistry that makes us healthier. The idea of neuroplasticity is an idea that says we can literally change the way our brain functions by meditating on the word and thinking about these things in ways that over a period of time, if we stick to it, can literally renew our mind. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may know the will of God, which is good, acceptable, and perfect. So I thought about that, and I engaged in ways that uh, helped me get there. A huge part of the re renewal of the mind, and something that I submit to generous men, is something you can think about, is are you the owner of everything you've accumulated, or is God the owner? Now for years, I could say God's the owner, but I didn't believe it. I mean, that was lip service. It wasn't confirmed by my behavior. But when you come to the actual belief through faith that God is the owner, that he's blessed you to create this wealth, that your security is in him, and that he encourages you to lay up wealth in heaven, it's a completely different mindset that changes the way you think about what you've accumulated and what you might be available to give. It's not, it becomes more a matter of not how much is enough to give away, but how much is enough to keep so that I can give everything away. Randy Elkhorn, in his book, The Treasure Principle, talks about the Civil War and the Confederacy and Confederate currency. If you were in the Confederacy near the end of the Civil War and had a little bit of foresight, you had a pretty good idea that your Confederate currency wasn't going to be worth much of anything at the end of the war. So if you had been smart back then, you'd be flipping your Confederate currency for a Union currency because that was going to have ongoing value applicable to our lives in terms of accumulating earthly riches, what are they going to be worth when we show up at St. Peter uh, at the pearly gates, hopefully not in a limousine, they're not going to be worth anything, but what does have eternal value is the treasure that we, we can lay up in heaven. Beyond renewal of the mind, the whole idea about progressively thinking about giving more as a behavioral trait is something that I thought about and Sally and I engaged in and I compare it to a light switch on a wall where you, first of all, you need to flip the power on. You need to connect to the Lord in the context of giving. But then it's like a rheostat where if you take a hold of that little button and you start to turn it, the light increases. If you back off, it gets darker. Generous giving as a behavioral act increases the light of the world's ability to come into your life and make you a more generous person. So the whole idea of step-by-step -step progressive generosity and I think it's a road that over time each of us is on a unique journey. When Sally and I went back to church when we were 30 years old, we went back because our oldest son Andy was four years old. We didn't go back because we thought we should. And we of course put a few bucks in the, uh, in the offering plate. We didn't write a check because we didn't want the church to have our contact information. You know, we, uh, we knew that if they had their contact information we'd be in the nursery the next day or the next week. So uh, sure enough, we progressed, we started writing checks, and where were we the next week? We were in the nursery, okay? But there's an opportunity in life to be on a generosity journey with the Lord walking with you through the eye of the needle, where it moves from cash giving to writing checks to thinking about tithing, to maybe tithing on the net, tithing on the gross, tithing off investments, thinking about the question of how much do I really need? Do I give off my cash flow or I do, do, I, do I give off my complete statement of uh, my financial wherewithal? Do I give from principle and do I have a plan in effect that makes me okay in my relationships with my family but when I get to the pearly gates uh, makes provision for kingdom work as well? Along that journey I think there's a, a, a degree of intimacy that just makes a great difference in our lives. And so to a generous group of men led by uh, the strongest of all men and the power of the Holy Spirit, I think we have a journey into intimacy that's available to us. Generosity is absolutely about helping other people and we feel good about that. But generosity transcends that into a personal question of my own journey with the Lord. And there's a tremendous amount of benefit that flows to us directly as we grow in that intimacy with Him. 
So do we have a vision for that? No matter how much we have, you know, there's radical disproportionate wealth allocation in America. We all know that. If the top one-tenth of one percent gave away 80 percent of what they have, they'd still be in the one percent. If the one percent gave away 80 percent of what they have, they'd still be in the five percent. But Jesus looked at the widow and her might. She had very, very little. Those of us in the room have differing amounts of wealth, but Jesus looks at our heart, no matter what we have, and invites us into a more intimate journey by thinking about how we can be generous people, not just in terms of what we might financially give, but how can we serve others along the journey. So there is an opportunity. Do we have a vision for that? Can we change the way we think about that? Can our mind be renewed? And do we engage on a journey of actually giving incrementally more and experience the glory and the joy and the benefit of how that comes back to us in so many ways, celebrating along the way? So I think that's it for today, gentlemen. It's an honor to be with you. I encourage you to think about your own journey, your own upbringing, your own sigmoid curves, the seasons that you're in. But the Lord is standing there at the eye of the needle looking to walk with you through that in a way that will bring you, bring you great joy and greater meaning. God bless. Any kind of a question or comment or a specific request? Or... Yes, sir. I have a joke that you can use, Jay. Thank you. How many of you had a dad who was evidently worried about leaving you too much? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. This is a uh, New Yorker cartoon that I've got that I didn't use in this presentation where a dad's sitting at a desk and he says, son, I have realized that everything I have was given to me by your grandfather and I now realize that was a grave mistake. <laughs> yes, sir. In the halftime experience, we take a sincere, trusted, safe, confidential look at the life experience of our partners that are in the halftime uh, journey with us. And without question, there are experiences in their life where if they come to acknowledge the price they paid, what price did they pay to create the wealth they've got, um, uh, they have to take a step back and realize that they made some mistakes, oftentimes relationally, oftentimes in marriage, oftentimes with kids, oftentimes with priorities. So there is, for many, this realization that I need to become honest and deal with uh, who I've been and uh, you know, deal with that and uh, seek restoration where possible in order to get back on a path that takes me where I want to go. But yes, that's an important observation. Okay, you're off duty, buddy, thanks. Okay. I just want to make an observation and then we'll get you out of here. And I, I want to be clear on this. Um, I want to boast in Christ right now because what you have just heard is a doctorate level, deeply profound, incredibly potential, multiplying seminar of biblical wisdom, specifically to giving that can transform us. And, and only God did this. You know, we've had a lot of great speakers and we're appreciative of every one of them, but but um, there hasn't been a speaker with any more substance than what was just shared here. So um, Dan Fashionbauer is back there. He does a great job of producing videos that are on YouTube. You can go to YouTube, leading with, enter Leading with Power. We have kind of like our own channel there. And then this will be up in a matter of a few days. And you can share it with others and you can link other people with it. And um, in the short time I've known Jay, he has demonstrated this generosity. Many of you have received this book. When he mentioned that this book is available at the table, it's available free of charge for, for you. I do have that right, don't I? Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and when I offered to um, reimburse him for his trip here and for his travel expenses, he declined that. And I just want you to know this is authentic. He's living it. It's transformational. It's incredibly biblical. And, and if you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, ask for some help and make a start because 
the free, the Bible says you should know the truth and the truth will set you free. And living in this uh, mindset, overcoming mammon, uh, also overcomes anxieties and stress, which then in turn free up the body to heal itself. Um, that book about switch on your brain, I highly recommend that. Many in our generation have been taught from an early age that we're born with X number of brain cells and that's all we're going to get and we're only going to lose them over time. And there's things you and I have done, let's be honest, to lose them at a higher rate of speed in our formative days and years and last week. <laughs> But there is new brain science. This author of this book is a she's a she's a a brain expert, but she's also a believer. And what they're showing now is when the Bible says God's mercies are made new every day, that actually happens in the brain. We actually do have new neurology, new ne neurons that we're born with every morning. And and God when God's um, grace is made new when God's mercies are made new every day. It's a specific mercy. It's a new mercy. It's not the same mercy. It's a growing mercy because of our growing need. And anyway, I just want to highly recommend that book um, for those of you that are dealing with any kinds of thinking issues or physical challenge issues or just to sharpen your focus uh, on that. So. Thank you, Jay, for being here. It was a great blessing. And uh, I, I, I used to say, Brandon Williams, who spoke at Madison, said this better than I say it. I always try to tell men who are interested in starting leading with power in their cities that if you're excited about the truth that anybody can count the number of seeds in an apple, but no one can count the number of apples in a seed, this might be for you because that's what excites me. Uh, Brandon Williams says it this way, that, that God implants a seed in each of us, and in that seed there is an orchard. And so I just want you to know the seeds have been planted, and, and there are orchards ready to bloom uh, from this room and beyond, and thank you again for thank being you, here. Thank you, Keith.